of on the edge. He was so confident in who he was, he didn't have to have a producer to tell him what to record. He knew what he could sing, and he went out there and he sang it. For Elvis to appreciate a song of any kind, it had to do one of two things. It either had to be created by a friend. Created by a friend, it didn't matter what it said or what it sounded like, he would put it on a record. Or it had to be something directly related to what he had experienced in his marriage and in his life. I used to smoke, drink, and dance a hoochie coo. I used to smoke and drink, smoke and drink, and dance a hoochie coo. Oh, oh yeah. Now I'm standing on this corner, praying for me and you. Ha, ha, ha. That's why I'm saved. I'm saved. People, let me tell you about it. While gospel music remained part of his daily life, Elvis began investigating other religions in his quest to become what God intended. Of different people who were trying to influence him in different ways uh, in different religions that came to him people that were not Christian people that were not uh, necessarily didn't necessarily believe in in the Holy Bible that we believe in uh, and they were trying to influence him in different ways but it seemed like he was always able to come back to the teaching that he had when he was a boy Elvis would read these other books and just be educated. But he would read the Bible and he would find a great measure of, of peace, a great measure of joy. Therefore, he spent a lot of time reading that because he liked the feeling that he got when he read it. He said, uh, you never stood in that man's shoes or saw things through his eyes or stood and watched with helpless hands while the heart inside you dies. So help your brother along the way, no matter where he starts. But the same God that made you, made him too. These men with broken hearts. When you get in, in, in big trouble, and it seems like the whole sky is falling, 99 out of 100 people will do one of two things. They'll either say, oh God, help me. Or they will take a Bible and read it or call a preacher. You're looking for something outside of yourself 
that's smarter than you, got more than you've got, can do more than you can do to help you get you out of the problem that you just found yourself in. I remember Daddy making reference to the fact that, that in the wee hours of the morning, after everybody would have left the suite, that they would, would stay together and read the Bible and talk about religion. I'm not saying they held a revival meeting. I mean, you know, they, they were in the top floor of the Hilton, for goodness sakes, in Las Vegas, but, and, and everybody had fun. But I know that there were times when, when Elvis would have crisis, you know, come up, and, and uh, I know that they would call Daddy to, to come and, and talk with Elvis, and, 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 um, and he would pray with him and say, Elvis, at a time like this, you, you can only turn to God. And, the, and Elvis was very religious. He, he believed in, in um, you know, going to church. He believed in reading the Bible. He loved, you know, gospel music. He believed in healing. He never forgot the Bible beginnings that his mother had taught him from the time they were very poor in Mississippi. And, and yeah, I think Daddy was a spiritual influence on Elvis. Actually, he could sit down and be one of the people that could give Elvis advice. Elvis had known J.D. since he had been very young. So he looked up to and respected J.D. I think he listened to a lot of what J.D. had to tell him. In 1973, Elvis approached Donnie Sumner, J.D.'s nephew and a former member of the Stamps, with an unusual employment offer. Elvis loved Donnie so much, he asked Donnie to form a group called Voice to uh, work around all the different houses in Graceland and Palm Springs and Beverly Hills, to have a group to sing at his uh, beckoning, sing gospel music. It was the most enjoyable, most fast-paced, most uh, unboring job I ever had. The reason being was just about anywhere from 18 to 20 hours of every day, we were actively involved in doing something. We get those phone calls usually to say, uh, Elvis is flying to Palm Springs, catch a plane, go check in the Hilton, uh, we'll call you tomorrow night. And we go check in around eight, eight or nine o'clock, they'd say, come to the house. Elvis is uh, up and about, and I think he, he'll probably wanna sing some tonight. So we'd go to, to the house in Palm Springs, and they'd say, uh, the, the faucet didn't work in the bathroom, and he got upset, and he drove to L.A., so check out drive to L.A., check in the Holiday Inn Hollywood, we'll call you. So we'd go check in, and then the same thing would happen in Beverly Hills. He would call from the house, and they'd call and say, come to the house, Elvis wants to see you guys. And we'd come over, and we'd watch TV a little bit, and then he'd get around the piano and start singing. But that's the way it usually happened was, he'd just want to see us, you know? And that usually meant he was in the mood to, to sing gospel songs, so. Our regular schedule went something around the home, went, uh, something in, in this order. We would get up about two o'clock in the afternoon and we would all one by one find our way into the living room and uh, we would make collective small talk somewhere around maybe four or five o'clock. Elvis would show up and then we'd sit all together around the den just laughing, joking, telling stories and basically having fun. And somewhere possibly in the middle of the night uh, we would get around to singing. And as I speak with my hand raised, the gospel truth, sometimes we would sing four or five hours around the piano. Charlie Hodge played the piano, I played the piano, Elvis played the piano, Sean Nielsen played the piano, and we had at that point Tony Brown as the pianist for my group, Voice Incorporated, and Tony played the piano. So we had plenty of piano players. We had plenty of singers. I got a chance to see Elvis in, in the background, you know, like around the house, uh, reading books, watching TV. We'd go shopping with him and stuff. And got to sort of see the personal side of him and got to realize that he was really just a normal human being, a very nice man. And, uh, and got to uh, see how much he loved gospel music because the reason we were hired was when he wanted to sing around the house he had someone to sing with, someone to sing the harmonies on those old gospel songs, and that's what he wanted to sing. He didn't want to sing jailhouse rock or uh, a rock and roll song. He always wanted to sing uh, those old spirituals or gospel hymns or uh, He Touched Me or whatever, you know. 
Uh, and that was my job, and I knew all those songs. So I'd hear him humming along. My, that was a cue to run to the piano, what, find out what key he was in. And they would all gather around the piano, and for the next two or three hours, we would uh, sing songs like that. And it was really fun. And uh, we'd read the Bible around the couch and all kinds of things. Took karate with him. Um, and there, was, there were times when we would be with uh, the whole entourage, which would be like uh, Red West and Sonny and um, all the bodyguards and all the people that were sort of part of his uh, inner circle. And he would just look around the room and say, uh, pick about three of us and say, come with me. And we'd go upstairs like in Graceland, go to his bedroom, he'd close the door. He had this old turntable. He'd play the same song 20 times and say, listen to this. And he just, you could tell he was so, so into it. He had a record collection you wouldn't believe. Everybody had ever sung a gospel song, seemingly. He, he had their, all their library of what they had done down through the years. I was in my office in, in Memphis one day. The phone rang. It was Maud Amy Humbard calling. She said, uh, Rex and I are at Caesar's Palace. We're on vacation, and we'd like to go see Elvis. And you, can you get us in? I said, well, yeah, I'm sure I can. So I called J.D. at the Hilton and woke him up. <laughs> and I said, uh, Rex and Maud Amy are up at Caesar's, and they want to come to Elvis' show. So J.D. got on front row seats that night. And they related how they enjoyed the show. And then Elvis asked for him to come back to his dressing room between the shows. Well, Maud Amy spoke up and said, I've been praying for you for years, Elvis. You're my bell sheep. And Elvis says, what's a bell sheep? He had no idea. I said, well, Elvis, in the Holy Land, there's one sheep that has a bell on it. And when he moves, it rings, and the other sheep move with him, and they lead. And Maud Amy then broke back in, said, Elvis, I believe you're my bell sheep, and I'm praying that you will have a spiritual experience that will cause you to lead millions of people to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it was at that point that this moved Elvis. He was already in a spiritual mood, moved him in such a way that he began to weep. And his body he began to tremble as weeping. And I grabbed his hands, and of course we all joined hands, and I had a prayer with him. I asked the Lord to give him peace in his mind, strength in his body, and also the Holy Spirit with peace in his soul. This is a wonderful, wonderful time that we had in prayer. And he was weeping and crying at that particular time. Then little Lisa came and opened the door and looked up and said, why is my daddy crying? And he patted her on the head and said, it's all right. It's all right. You wait outside. It's, everything's all right. And he closed the door and left her outside. This was quite moving that he wanted. I kept saying, you have other people here that wants to meet you and see you. And he says, grab my hand. He said, please don't leave me. Stay here with me. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells His close friends became increasingly concerned about his health and his well-being. I had like this feeling that I, you know, I don't think that as, as a friend and a Christian that I have done enough to, to, to say to him, I care about you, uh, you know, I care about what's happening to you. So I, um, I had a living Bible. At the time, the living Bible had just come out and it was paraphrased, and uh, it was just seemed like to me it was something easy to read, and that I should give him this living Bible. It was just, and so I wrote, um, I wrote an a little inscription inside the Bible to Elvis, 
Joe took the Bible to a concert in Huntsville and presented it to Elvis privately after the performance. I was really moved to say that I know in your search for some real stability in your life uh, that you're out there, you're looking, you know, you're out, you're, you're really searching and you're looking for something. But I said, this book has all the answers. You don't have to look any further. Just read it. He will guide each step I take And if I fall, I know he'll understand Till the day he tells me why He loves me so He read the inside and he did something that, I, that he'd never done to me before. You know, we'd always, it's always a handshake and all that. And he, you know, or he's, he's, he's pretty demonstrative about his, his uh, you know, as a man, you know, you know, some men hug and some shake hands and some pat you on the back, you know. But this time, he took my, he took his, his arm around my head and pulled my, my head close to his head, like, and just kind of squeezed our, our foreheads together, like, you know. And he said, thanks, you know, thanks a lot. It means a lot to me. And, uh, and that was kind of it. It was like an embrace, you know. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if it did any good, but in my heart, you know, that's what I wanted, I wanted him to have at the time. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on and stand. On August 16, 1977, the tragic news spread that Elvis had died in his beloved home, Graceland. Take my hand, precious love. Me Mr. Vernon, Elvis's dad, uh, called JD and wanted him to come over there to Memphis and kind of help him with this thing, help him with the funeral. He trusted old J.D., you know, and they just kind of liked a, J.D. was a family member, member so to speak. Uh, so J.D. and myself went over there and uh, we sat right there in the uh, den there in the jungle room and made out the, uh, the funeral, the whole program. I received a call from Memphis, J.D. Sumner, and also Mr. Presley, Elvis's father. And he told me that he had passed away. And I said, well, I knew that. I heard it on the radio. He said, well, what we're calling about is Mr. Presley wants you to come and preach at the funeral. And also, he wants you to tell what happened when you and your wife, Maud Amy, met with him in Las Vegas. At the river I stand, guide my feet, hold my hand. I remember pulling into Graceland as we pulled into the gates and, and I saw those 20,000 people. My first thought was, this guy's like the president of the United States. I mean, it, this is like, this is big. And it just went all over me how big his death was. And so we drive up to the house, and of course, everyone uh, that is anyone was there. In fact, I saw Caroline Kennedy sitting on the steps uh, leading up to his bedroom. She was a little girl. Um, and Elvis is uh, the kitchen. They were cooking food. It was like an old Southern wake, you know. You come in the front door, and, and to the right is the living room, and to the left, it's like most of these antebellum houses, to the left is the dining room, you know? So, so there's not a lot of room in there, and, but there's a couple hundred people, you know, just crammed into the, the, these first couple rooms. And so um, when it came time, Rex Humbard uh, did the eulogy, and, uh, and the quartets, of course, would come and sing around the piano, uh, and, and everybody else then, there were some chairs in the living room where the immediate family sat, of course. And then the hallway, or the vestibule that, that between the living room and the, and the dining room, 
uh, at starting there and all the way into the dining room, there were just people crammed in there, you know, trying to, to look into the living room to see what was going on. The ones that were there were friends or staff or close people. The public was not invited at all to that funeral. The quartets were there that he had sang with and they'd sang with him. Uh, his manager, of course, Colonel Parker. Some of the Hollywood people that he had known was present there also. But the main thing was the spirit and the feeling that was generated when all this gospel music was sang by these various quartets as a group, not as individual quartet, but as all of them came together, their voices was tremendous. And it was something that created an atmosphere that was very, very spiritual, which made it easy when I got ready to talk. When Joe Garcio, who was Elvis orchestra director, learned that I was going to sing How Great Thou Art, he came to me, he said, Mr. Blackwood, he said, I have directed Elvis singing How Great Thou Art hundreds of times. Would you give me the honor of letting me direct it one last time? I said, why, sure. And when I did How Great Thou Art, Mr. Gershio stood over the side, directed me with tears running down his face. That's a scene that I, uh, is indelible in my memory. I will never, never forget that moment. What a touching, touching thing it, it was. We It wasn't like a particular group, like the Blackwood Brothers didn't sing, or the Statesmen, or the Imperials, or the Jordanaires, but it was a member or two from different groups put together to make a group and to sing some songs that Elvis would have wanted to hear. And I had to, you know, and I played uh, for one of the numbers, and it was a it was a makeup group with a, you know with different members, Jake, and um, and of course uh, uh, they did they did several songs. Vernon wanted me to sing known only to him. That was one of his favorite gospel songs. And after that, we had the funeral procession. I rode in the front car. And as we went down the street, thousands and thousands of people, families, aged, young people, older people. But one thing impressed me that I'll never forget. We came up to a cross street. And at that cross street, there was a guy on a motorcycle. The sleeves is all cut out, red, big tattoos on his arms. And as we came down the street toward him. He reached up and got this great big helmet sitting on that big motorcycle. He put it over his heart. And when we came by, he put his hand up to his head and saluted. I thought, what love. Father.
Grieving fans gathered at the front gate for a massive candlelight vigil. As a kindness to those assembled, the casket was placed in the foyer of the mansion, and mourners were allowed to file by and pay their respects. On August 18th, the normally short drive to Forest Hill Cemetery took over an hour due to the throngs gathered to mark his passing. The occasion had all the trappings of a state funeral. There are a few things in people's memories they will never forget, like um, when JFK was shot, Martin Luther King was shot, when Elvis died, that uh, will just be in a person's memory, I suppose, very vividly, forever. And that day uh, will be in my memory forever. I will always regret uh, he called me the last show was in Indianapolis. And uh, he called me uh, before he left. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't leave the building that night. Always they say, it, ladies and gentlemen, Elvis has left the building, but he stayed that night. And uh, he called me back into his dressing room. And he